Well, in ALS, we now have a very big body of uh, new data. And this new data is mostly genetic data. So a lot of uh, clinical researchers have uh, collected um, patient DNA and they have sequenced it, which is basically uh, identifying where there's some errors in your DNA. And from this they have identified several genes that are uh, mutated in uh, uh, patients with ALS. And this has, um, because these genes are mutated, it also means that these genes have a uh, function particularly for the, uh, for the motor neurons, which is um, the, the key um, cells in, the, in, your, in your body that actually die when you have a motor neuron disease. There is some evidence for um, defects that specifically link to these motor neurons, because one of the key features, one of the key characteristics is that these motor neurons are very large. So the cell bodies can sit in your spinal cord, but they have long fibers, axons, that innervate your muscle, even in your, in your foot. So they are very, very large cells, They're among the largest cells in your body. And there's evidence that, for example, trafficking along these axons, back and forward, is uh, disrupted in, in, in motor neuron diseases. We don't know why it's disrupted. In fact, what we believe now is that it's more than one defect, more than one error, which causes motor neuron disease, that you might even have um, two different mechanisms that uh, need to kick in to actually cause the disease. So one defect could be, for example, a motor neuron um, uh, trafficking defect. But on top of this could be an, another, um, um, let's say, metabolic which is basically uh, depending on your, uh, how your body produces energy, or it could also be toxins, environmental toxins, how they affect the your motor neurons. So there is basically now what we call evidence for uh, a mix between two uh, a genetic defect and an envi environmental uh, defect. This is very much disputed and this is a lot of research went into this as well. It could be nutrition. There's some evidence that nutrition could be uh, influencing it. There's evidence that um, uh, environmental uh, toxins that are produced in the in in environment can contribute to this. And the multiple factors can be, let's say, two gene defects, or sometimes just only one gene defects, plus um, a second cause. And sometimes it's actually just simply aging, because we know as well that is, an, is similar to Alzheimer's disease, is also an age-related motor neuron disease. It it's affects people earlier than an Alzheimer's disease, but aging is also still a risk factor, as we call it. It's not, not as pronounced as an Alzheimer's disease, but still, you know, these patients, also when they have mutations, they survive, or they're doing fine, they have no symptoms for 30, 40 years, but then suddenly they develop something. So on, on top of, uh, they develop the disease. So on top of your genetic defect, there's also evidence that maybe over time, something in your body accumulates, for example, uh, free radicals, or that you cannot handle some energy problems that well anymore. And this can also then basically later in your life um, uh, cause a, uh, uh, a, a disease. So also patients that have, for example, mutations in ALS genes develop the disease normally, uh, you know, around uh, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, or, or even later in the 70s. This is still in, your, in the field a matter of discussions and of research, but there's some evidence, let's say, that uh, there's some studies on Italian football players or people who are high-performance athletes that they might actually uh, have a higher risk of, uh, uh, big, big of, of getting uh, ALS. This, could like, this is still controversial, I have to say. It doesn't mean that if you do uh, run marathons, play a lot of football or soccer, that you will get ALS. It's just a risk factor that maybe doubles or triples your risk, maybe. But um, the effect of um, prolonged energy um, for pro prolonged energy crisis that people have if they do marathons or soccer could in theory contribute, let's say, to a second defect, similar to what I just explained 
to you early on. It could be that it's a, um, a combined effect of uh, specific people who are susceptible, who just have some gene makeup that makes them more vulnerable to, uh, to um, damages caused by prolonged exercise. No, I don't think there's uh, so far much evidence for this. I, w I would say that this has been studies have shown that, that exercise, extreme exercise could be a risk factor, but for medication it's, it's not, um, okay. it hasn't been much studied. It will, it, no, I don't have a rate for you, but it would be a similar figure. In fact, ALS is actually more common than people think. It's quite a, a common disorder of the nervous system, what we call a neurodegenerative disorder. It's quite common, but unfortunately patients with ALS uh, um, have the disease for quite a limited period of time, so, so th that you have a high uh, number of cases new diagnosed, but at the same time people living with disease are not as high as with other diseases. Well, the pharmaceutical industry normally goes for the big diseases. And the big diseases in the neurosciences are obviously psychiatric disorders, because they can actually, you know, uh, provide a therapy for these patients for the rest of their life. Other disorder which is studied quite well in similar neurological disorder, in like, like ALS, is Alzheimer's disease. A lot of emphasis went into Alzheimer's disease. However, these studies are sometimes very, or these diseases are sometimes difficult to study. And many com com companies now, including big multinational companies, move away from these common diseases and have now also discovered what they call rare diseases. So many companies now go also for these rare diseases as uh, an interesting marketing opportunity. But also, of course, there's a lot of interest from patient groups. They've been very active, um, particularly in the rare disease areas. That a lot of uh, patient organizations actually spoke up and said, listen, there's a problem, we need to target this. I am not a clinician, so actually treating patients myself, so I don't treat ALS patients, but I know from our clinical colleagues that Relotech works in some patients, in other patients it does not work. So what we really need also for therapies such as Relotech is actually good, um, uh, what we call these basically biomarkers, which can indicate which patient will b benefit from Relotech and which patient might not benefit from Relotech. But at the moment, this is the only drug that is currently um, uh, uh, approved by most um, countries, not all countries. Some countries have, have, have basically uh, withdrawn the approval. But it's currently the only therapeutic option, and uh, the response rates in a, uh, occurs only in, in, in a small population of the patients, so not every patient will benefit from it. And it still has uh, a good um, um, uh, beneficial effect if it works in, in those subset of patients. But overall what the field really needs is um, more therapeutics to actually individualize the treatment, something we call a personalized medicine approach. It is amazing. So we call extreme survivors. And one approach that's been discussed in the field as well, studying the genetic makeup of those extreme survivors. Because they're really interesting, because they must have something in their, in their genetic makeup that makes them so resistant. There's something, what we call a protective factor, is probably uh, uh, working in, in those individuals. Um, so it's, but on, on the other hand, you have also those who actually progress very, very rapidly. So you have this fast pro progressing individuals, you have individuals who progress slowly, and you have these, what, what's been called extreme survivors. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, a lot of uh, investigators, clinical investigators, have uh, studied ALS patients for, for many, many years, and they got, their DNA, they got the DNA from those patients. And uh, this was basically, this is blood, you can take the DNA just from blood from the patients, and they have sequences. And here in a bigger international study that involved Irish scientists, um, but also scientists from, uh, from, from the UK, from France, and from, from North America, they found uh, mutations in a very small population of patients in a, of a gene uh, that we call angiogenin. And what this gene does, this gene, if it's mutated in those patients, 
uh, causes a uh, defect in blood vessel formation. And this um, protein that is made from, from this gene, it's called angiogenin, is actually something that motor neurons send out when they have problems. So when motor neurons are in the process of having problems, the process of before they die, when they actually see, well, there's something wrong with us, they actually produce this protein, they make this protein that's encoded by this gene, they make this protein to actually then increase blood supply to those motor neurons so that they, that they get more energy. And this can also be used therapeutically. So we have found now that if we treat um, 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 motor neurons that we can take, for example, we isolate them, we treat them with this protein that they survive better. So it boosts the survival of motor neurons. And what we also find is if we give those um, angiogenin to uh, preclinical uh, models of the disease, the, and these are basically uh, studies that we do uh, where we put a, a, a human mutation into an, an animal model. If we treat those animals with this protein, actually it, um, it's increasing their survival and the symptoms that they develop are slowing much, much slower over time. So it's slowing down the symptoms of the disease. And we know now from our research that this protein, if we give it uh, systemically, which means we actually give it, uh, let's say, through, uh, through IV, um, intravenous uh, application, actually increases or normalizes the uh, blood vessel defects that you normally would see in, in, uh, in, in ALS patients or in these ALS uh, 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 preclinical models. It's a long, long way to actually go through this process. So what we have now, and this was funded initially by the Thierry Latan Foundation, so they basically helped us to identify what this protein, what this protein does. So we have a bigger understanding now what it does. We know now how it works a little bit better, or quite precisely now. We know that it actually also is, is good for motor neurons, but it can also increase the blood supply to motor neurons. So it's like a double effect. It hits basically two important aspects. Both motor neuron survival is boosted, and also the blood vessel supply is boosted. And this protein now, uh, we have now a joint collaboration with a big multinational company. I cannot name this for legal reasons because they, they do a development program. But what they want to do now is that they actually take this protein now and modify it to make it um, um, longer available in the body. And the ultimate goal we have basically is then to develop this through uh, toxicology studies that you need to do to see that it doesn't harm, has no harmful effects, and also to make it um, biostable. So there has to be done a lot of studies on how the protein is, can be best delivered to have the best effect. And the next step would be then uh, testing this then also in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in patients. And we hope that this will be uh, coming within the next uh, one or two years, might be ending up in, in the first clinical trials. Unless we really correct the genetic defect, it will be difficult to reverse the disease. So what this treatment currently does is that it actually slows down the progression and increases survival. But the clinical studies will have to show whether this protein can actually do, do more than that. Yeah, but so far our studies more indicate that it's actually uh, stopping the disease or slowing it down significantly, similar to, to uh, 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 what you currently do in those patients that, that get Relotec, that are responding to Relotec, what you see there clinically as well. This will be our first target, which is a very, very important target, to give the, the pa patients who actually have the disease a longer quality, quality of life. Um, in the future, it will be possible that you basically have a, a therapy like Relotec or Angiogenin, if this is, can be developed to, uh, up to the clinical um, uh, studies, plus maybe something that corrects some genetic um, uh, uh, modification in those patients. And this, therapies could then actually also in the future um, not only stop disease but hopefully also eventually uh, can co correct the disease. Very good point and this is really a strength of the ALS community. It's a very, the researchers are 
know each other quite well. The clinicians see, work with their patients, they see their patients day by day and they know exactly how terrible this disease is. And the ALS community in Europe but also in the States are also the, have a very big support from charities. And there's a lot of infrastructure and networks such as the NCULTS in Europe, which is a network, European network for the cure of ALS, where people meet every year where they discuss progresses between clinicians and basic scientists working together on, on this disease. And clinicians also have other structures such as the TRI, TRI ALS, which is a trial network for ALS between clinicians, so that findings can be translated into a clinical trial program very rapidly in Europe. So ALS really is quite unique in, 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 in that sense, as more of these diseases were actually clinicians and basic scientists, and now also the pharma industry actually work hand in hand. We do meet patients and sometimes patients also contact me by, by email and of course they want to know when this drug will be developing in the treatment and they will be interested in participating in trials and then I refer those patients on to our clinicians who basically are uh, engaged in the clinical, trial, clinical trials networks. There's a lot of researchers and clinicians and charities actually are really trying to make a difference with those patients to really develop some new therapeutics to actually affect the disease in a positive manner. Particularly also with the new genetic, and genetic um, studies we, that, that have been done over the last couple of years, we have now so much more knowledge that we can apply to actually find for each patient potentially different treatments. And I think this looks very promising in the next, in the next, for the next couple of years.